12 years ago, I, I was sitting in a, in a courthouse, uh, Supreme Court, Supreme Court House in, in downtown Toronto. I was sitting beside a man named Marvin, a man from a church where I was the minister. He asked me to sit with him during the trial of three young men who had been accused of killing Marvin's son. Marvin's son was 21 when he died, and two years before I had done that funeral. Now, my friend Marvin was devastated by the death of his son. His son wasn't a perfect young man, but it was his son. And he died violently suddenly on Carabana, Carabana weekend in Toronto. Sitting in the courtroom forced Marvin to relive his grief. But he felt he needed to be there to see this thing through. And he'd asked me to be there, and this is the way he said it, very directly. He said, I want you to be with me to remind me of what is right and what is good. I was humbled by that. I was honored and overwhelmed by his request. And the trial went on for months. So I was there as often as I could be. I was there near the beginning. I was there in the middle to hear the testimony and the, the awful questions and, and, and see, saw pictures. It was, it was terrible. And then I was there at the end when a verdict was made and then later on when sentencing happened. Marvin is a, a, a survivor of a lot of violence in his life. He, he lived through a bloody coup in Liberia where he'd been a police sergeant. And he left Liberia as a refugee with nothing. He's witnessed a lot of violence and he, in his time, he saw a lot of dark alley justice, street justice. There was this one day, there was a break in the, in the proceedings of the trial and we're sitting there waiting for what's going to happen next. And Marvin, sitting beside me, very quietly said, so only I could hear him, what is there, Reverend Darrow, what is there to stop me from doing to the young men on trial what they did to my son? It didn't sound like a question he wanted me to try to answer. He just needed to say it out loud. The real answer to that tough question was bigger than both of us. We just sat in the silence of a courtroom. Silence of a courtroom is a very different silence than the silence we have here. Waiting for the trial to carry on, our eyes went to the other side of the room where they were sitting in a row, the families of the three young men accused of killing Marvin's son. And Marvin turned to me and said, I could not wish on those parents the pain I feel at the loss of my son. My friend Marvin grew up in a remote village far to the north of Monrovia, which is the capital of Liberia. He grew up in a place where there is no running water. There's electricity that, that, that comes from generators if they work. There are almost no public services. There's no government presence. There was no school. He received some education in his early, early years and some religious training from Methodist missionaries. But the way he answered his own question, to me, sounded a lot like, if, if you look on the front cover of the bulletin, look near the top where, it's, where it says Hinduism. So Marvin said, I could not wish in those parents the pain that I feel at the loss of my son. The Hindu teaching that's printed there says, do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. Marvin and I have stayed in touch. For years, he worked as a security guard. 
He came to Canada having been a police sergeant in the Liberian National Force. Moves to Canada. Got a job as a security guard. He was grateful. He worked at Toronto City Hall. He's, he's recently retired and spends more than half the year back in his home village called, called Bonley. Again, north, north of Monrovia in Liberia. And uh, last week he told me he's supervising the construction of a high school. They've never had a high school in Bonley. Years ago, at the church I was serving, we raised money to buy the cement to, to build the pri- first primary school that was ever, ever in, that, in that little village. Now they're going to have a high school. Marvin hasn't allowed hardship, tragedy, or the evil that can befall us in this world and the things that can happen to our loved ones. None of that has turned him away from what I see as a deep, heartfelt understanding of the golden rule. He gets it. He lives it. He's made it the foundation of his life. Even so, even staring into the eyes of three young men who did kill his son, he could remember not to do unto others what he wouldn't want done to him. So that front cover you were looking at just now, it's a reproduction of a poster. It's produced by the Scarborough Missions. It's a Roman Catholic order based in Scarborough here in Canada. It was originally the brainchild, the project of a guy named Paul McKenna, who's an active Catholic layperson and has devoted his life in recent years to interfaith dialogue, getting people from different religious backgrounds talking to each other. Way back in 2005, he had this idea of making a poster that would say the golden rule as it's expressed by all these different religions and cultures and traditions around the world. He worked on it for five years. He didn't just Google. He went and he talked to teachers and preachers and leaders in all these religious traditions and said, so this is what I was thinking of using. What do you think? And they set him straight. And he found the right phrases from 13 13 different religious traditions that express each in their own way the golden rule. And then he, he worked with artists and graphic designers to choose a symbol that was appropriate to each tradition. And again, all kinds of consultation went on to make sure it was done in a way that expressed the culture, the tradition of all these different peoples. The poster was officially launched and introduced to the world early in 2001, just a few months before September 11th. Since that time, it has been used all over the world now as a tool in that important work of encouraging people from different backgrounds to get to know each other. Encourage them to have mutual respect for each other, to be able to know, hey, we're different and we're not. We have some things in common. We share some values. And we didn't even know that, but we do. And the poster, I've seen it in my travels. I've seen it in different countries. I've seen it in schools. I saw it on the wall of a hospital in Nicaragua. And I thought, that's cool. I've seen it in schools, hospitals, in in churches, in people's homes. I haven't seen it, but apparently it's up in the Vatican. And it's up in the United Nations. Pretty cool. It's an amazing, powerful thing to see the same essential wisdom expressed as part of the holy teachings of all these different religions and cultures. I want to read a few of them together. Let's go back to the top of the page. Beside Hinduism, it says Buddhism. We'll read the version of the golden rule according to to the Buddhist tradition. Treat not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. I like that. Now, I I want you to go to the bottom right corner. We're going to read the one from Zoroastrianism. 
Do you remember, we talked about Zoroastrianism at Christmas time because the wise men who, who are said to go see Jesus, they're called magi. In the Zoroastrian religion, the priests are called magi. So some people think that the ones who went to visit Jesus were Zoroastrian priests. It's a religion way older than Judaism and, of course, way older than Christianity. So let's read their version down in the bottom left corner. Do not do unto others whatever is injurious to yourself. And then right beside it, a little, a little higher to the left, the, the one from Jainism. Jainism originated in India 600 years before the time of Jesus. And they're all about nonviolence. They won't even kill a fly. I don't, I don't think I could join them. But I like the way they say this. Let's read it together. One should treat all creatures in the world as one would like to be treated. So they're expanding their notion of not just what we do unto other people, but how do we treat all the creatures, everything made in the whole world. Horses and mosquitoes and frogs and birds of the air. I like the reminder there that we are part of something way bigger than just ourselves. I think our view of life is improved by remembering that. And it's always good to remember to think beyond ourselves. Paul McKenna, the guy who created the poster, he's very interested in what he calls self-transcendence. Which is another good way of saying get over yourself. Right? Right? Realize that you're not actually the center of the universe. The universe is a very interesting place with lots of stuff in it, and it's not just us. It's not just me and what I want. Everybody's all connected. And if you're not doing well, I'm not doing well. Interconnected. The way he said it was, all the sacred writings are pushing us in the direction of self-transcendence. The surrender to something or someone beyond ourselves. And he says it's only in self-transcendence that we become fully ourselves. Fully human. Isn't it interesting? To, to become ourselves, we have to get over ourselves. Does that sound real? The older I get, the more sense that makes. Another way to say it is that the path to real joy, real life, being an actual full human being involves moving beyond ourselves as individuals, learning to live generously, remembering we're all interconnected, and that, our, that my well-being and your well-being are connected. My freedom and your freedom are connected. If you're not free, I'm not free. If you don't have meaning in your life, the meaning in my life is diminished. If you're not happy, I can't really be happy. Intrinsically, we're all bound up in each other. We need each other, can't live without each other, and, and, and if there isn't joy for everyone, there's less joy for all of us. The other message I get while reading all these different expressions of the golden rule from all these different traditions and cultures and languages is that every human being, wherever you come from, whatever you were born into, whatever you were taught when you were growing up, every one of us is a spiritual being. And every one of us, regardless of our religious background, what we were taught, we all have the capacity to sense the divine, to know there's something bigger than us, to tap into it, that love, that wisdom, to know something about the hopes and dreams of God. Even if you don't call it God, you know it's there. Which says to me that even though it's really good to be Christian, and we should d dive deep into being Christian, it's not the only way to be faithful. We don't have an exclusive connection to God. There's lots of phone lines. People from all over the place can call into God, and God's talking to them too. When we meet the presence of God, whether it's in a peaceful sanctuary beautiful place on Sunday morning, or if it's, it's enjoying the glory of a sunset over a northern lake, or maybe it's looking into the eyes of a, of a child, 
whenever we see or sense the presence of God and we let it in, it changes us. It opens us up, maybe only for a, a moment, to that realization that life, everybody's life, is sacred and that we're blessed and that God doesn't just like us. God is interested just in us, but God has love and compassion for all of us, for the whole of creation, for every human being. When we get a sense of that, that overwhelming, reassuring, awe-inspiring love of God, and we see it's not just for us, people in our little club, but for every living thing, every person, even the people we don't like, the ones we find horrible or alien or confusing or, or we've been taught to think of as enemies or just them, we begin to want peace for them and joy for them and well-being for all of us and we want to find a way to accept everybody for who they are. Not for who we want them to be, just for who they are. We want every living, every living being, every living creature, every human to know they're loved by God. And then we've got to figure out, if that's what we want, how are we going to do that? How do we turn our words and actions over to this task of communicating God's great love for every person? That's what people around the world are working on. People like us and people very different from us trying to figure it out. How do we show God's love in this world? Amen.